definition of the Internet of Things. As you can see, the definition is quite large. So let's break it down a little. What is the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is a self-configuring and an adaptive system. What does it consist of? It consists of networks of sensors and smart objects. And what is the goal of the Internet of Things? The goal of the Internet of Things is to interconnect these objects and sensors and create an intelligent ecosystem of these objects. So in brief, the Internet of Things is a network of these smart objects that can be connected to the Internet. The features of these objects are that they should be uniquely addressable and accessible over the Internet and they should be programmable as well. Let's look at a simple example. Let's say you have a smart microwave which can tell you when the oven is hot enough to bake your cake and you have a thermostat which tells you the temperature and allows you to control it. Now going back to the definition, you need to be able to address it uniquely such that you know it is the thermostat from room number 53 for example and you need to be able to access it remotely and hence it should be connected to the internet directly or indirectly through another device. Moreover, you may want to, to set a rule that turns on the cooler when the thermostat reaches a certain value. So, the devices need to be programmable as well. Now, let's look at what functions these smart objects perform. These objects can perform sensing. That is, they are equipped with sensors which read the environmental surrounding and returns a measured value. For example, a humidity sensor that can measure the humidity of the ambient air can be a sensor on a IoT device. These smart objects can be actuators as well. Actuators can change the state of the environment based on the values generated by these sensors. So a sensor can measure the ambient light intensity while an actuator, in this case a lamp, can be turned on to make the streets brighter in a smart city application. Some of these smart objects are equipped with both sensing and actuating modules and thus can perform both functions. A simple example can be your mobile device which can detect your motion through the accelerometer sensor and alert you when for example you are sitting for too long. And that too is an example of an application of the Internet of Things. Finally, coming to the use cases. The use cases of IoT is spanned over many areas. Some examples are Industry 4.0, where Internet of Things is playing a major role in supply chain, monitoring and maintenance of industrial devices. For example, the devices that would require frequent repair can be monitored by sensors to preempt a failure, saving money for the company in terms of repairs. There are various applications in the smart city context as well, where air and water pollution monitoring and purification is a major application, along with smart lighting on the streets and smart parking management. Internet of Things is also applied in agriculture to optimize irrigation of crops for healthy harvests. We would learn more about these use cases throughout the course. I hope you are excited by the prospects of the Internet of Things and its vast number of applications. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me video serves as a follow-up of that with two main points of discussion. What are the main components of an IoT system? How are these components connected to each other? The answer is portrayed in this picture. 
it shows the components and their interplay from a very high level perspective. On the left side of the screen, you see a couple of simple systems where one or a collection of M2M devices exchanging data with M2M applications over the communication network. The M2M applications generally run on a cloud system. And on the right side of the screen, you see a gateway as well as a service capabilities layer are introduced to handle much more complex IoT scenarios. Now talking, talking about this components, there are six of them that you will see in any IoT systems. The first and foremost is the sensors and actuators, that is the M2M devices. These are capable of communicating data in response to a query or autonomously. And if you have read several IoT papers or articles, you'll see they're often called IoT devices as well as smart objects or smart things. The second component is M2M area network. It basically provides connectivity between the M2M devices and IoT gateways. Think of a scenario where a smartwatch is sending data to a smartphone over Bluetooth low energy. So here, Bluetooth acts as the M2M area network. The third component is M2M or IoT gateway. This is a very important piece of component in the entire IoT ecosystem and provides you with a lot of functionalities. I have captured four main functions here. Number one, it connects the M2M devices to the internet. In some cases, it enables protocol translation, M2M device interworking, and in edge computing scenarios, the gateway also acts as a local data processing unit. Moving on, the fourth component is core networks. It basically provides communication between the IoT gateways and the applications running on the cloud. The fifth component is the M2M applications. Now, this is very important. It basically contains the middleware where all the sensor data is processed. For example, this application can help determine if a parking position is empty or not. And finally, the most important of all, we have the cloud platforms. So nowadays, the different cloud systems have become indispensable for IoT ecosystems. So we have uh, the clouds helping us in IoT data processing, service provisioning, even long-term data storage. Uh, as an example, you can think of Google Cloud Platform, Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure as providers of such cloud platforms. Once you have understood about the component, the next point you have to understand is the ecosystem. The six components are part of the ecosystem, but to achieve that IoT ecosystem, you need two major steps. The first one is all the IoT devices or the M2M devices, they must be integrated with the software. And the second step is all the components need to be made available to be used together as a system. Now, the IoT architecture and data exchange protocols address the first item, whereas the second item still remains as a huge challenge. And before concluding the video, I just would like to share some of the statistics from the current IoT world, current IoT ecosystem with you. So according to Gartner, by the end of 2017, there will be 8.4 billion of IoT devices in use. That's a huge number. It's already more than the population of the Earth. And they uh, expect that these uh, connected devices, connected IoT devices, will reach 20.4 billion by 2020. And this enormous ecosystem actually brings a lot of uh, scope for business since the total spending on IoT devices and services will reach almost 2 trillion at the end of 2017. Previous video, Shomo talked about the IoT ecosystem and provided an overview. He gave us an insight into the components of the IoT ecosystem, which are the following. Devices, networks connecting these devices, gateways which act as an intermediate layer between the cloud platforms and the devices, and finally, the cloud platforms. In particular, I would focus on the cloud platform aspect of the IoT ecosystem. Coming back to cloud platforms, let's look at the gap in the IoT device ecosystem and what can be done to fill in this gap. 
The end devices are usually either data producers in the form of sensors or data consumers in the form of actuators or are both. The data produced is large and thus is usually overwhelming for the end device to store and process. Keep in mind that these devices are resource constrained with RAM ranging from a few kilobytes to a few megabytes with limited storage as well. Let's look at the storage aspect in a bit more detail. Coming back to cloud platforms, let's look at the gap in the IoT device ecosystem and what can be done to fill in this gap. The end devices are usually either data producers in the form of sensors or data consumers in the form of actuators or they can be both at the same time. The data produced is large and thus is usually overwhelming for the end device to store and process. Keep in mind that these devices are resource constrained with RAM ranging from a few kilobytes to a few megabytes with limited storage as well. Let's look at the storage aspect in a bit more detail. The data generated from the end devices can be categorized into two types, textual data and multimedia data in the form of images and videos. Looking at the textual data, let's consider an IoT device with an accelerometer with the three axes and light, humidity and gas sensors. Let's consider they are generating data every minute. Then, if we do the math, it generates 360 kilobytes per hour. That does not sound a lot, but imagine the amount of data it will generate in a year. I'll leave you to do the math. On the other hand, there are different applications which require images and videos in high resolution. For example, in a smart agriculture application, we might determine the state of a plant by applying image processing on an image of the leaf taken by a camera. The size of a high resolution image is often into a few megabytes. Moreover, in some monitoring applications like traffic monitoring in smart cities or retail monitoring where the surveillance is used to gather meaningful information, the data generated from the videos can very well go into a few gigabytes. Thus, we need to store the data elsewhere where the data is too large to be stored on the device. This decision depends on the following factors. We need to consider the amount of storage available on the device, the amount of bandwidth that the network provides among others. Depending on these factors, the devices may choose to offload raw data or might process the data to some extent before offloading. For example, in the case of the image processing application, we can process the RGB or colored image on the device and just send a grayscale image. In another use case, let us consider we want to monitor the movement or tremors on a bridge. At night, when the number of cars are fewer than in the day, we may not need data as fine-grained as in the morning. Thus, we can reduce the frequency at which the data is pulled. Next, we come to the data processing aspect of the previously discussed gap. Data processing in terms of the time period of data which is processed can be of two types, transient and long term. In transient data processing, we process recent data over a short period of time. For example, we can measure the activity of a user based on the accelerometer of a wearable device. We can also have the data processed historically when we look at the activity of the user for a longer period to predict a pattern. 
In this case though, one, the data set can be too large to be stored locally on the device and two, the resources required for processing the data can be beyond the capacity of the device. In this case, cloud M2M applications come in handy where we can run the application for processing the stored data on the cloud. In terms of the number of devices from which the data is collected, data processing can be broadly classified into two types again. Data can be processed from a single device while the data can also be processed from multiple devices. In the second case, if the application is running locally on one of the devices, that device may not have access or may not store the data from other devices. In this case as well, we need a cloud platform to have a wider visibility of the data for processing. This is all from me today. In the next video, I will talk about how the cloud platforms actually fill in this gap. Until then, if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, feel free to shoot them across. Previous video where I talked about the gap that exists with the IoT devices in terms of data storage and data processing. These devices are resource constrained, thus storing and processing historical data or data from multiple devices together can be seen as a problem. This gap is filled by the cloud services for the Internet of Things. Let's look at the different types of cloud services for the Internet of Things. They are platform as a service, software as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Let's delve into how these services offered differ from each other. In platform as a service, the cloud provider offers an application framework where you can write scripts or programs in different languages to process the data stored on the cloud provider or process the data accumulated from the device. For example, in the previous video, I talked about getting the data from a device with an accelerometer and a couple of other sensors. On the cloud platform, one can write a piece of code to process the data from the accelerometer sensor and extract information about the positioning of the end device if static or in motion. On the other hand, Software as a Service is a cloud service offering access to software running on the cloud. This piece of software usually acts like a black box. It takes some data as an input, performs the necessary processing and provides a desired output. Thus, this kind of service is usually use case specific and the opportunities for playing around with the code is limited. An example can be a company offering their software for water level monitoring in reservoirs in a smart city context. The applications are use case specific because the software might only support specific kinds of pumps from which the data is collected and a specific application for monitoring the water level. And finally, for infrastructure as a service, the service providers rent out server space. There is a lot of flexibility offered to the end user where the user can create a virtual machine from the resources offered and build a solution from scratch. Although this offers a lot of flexibility, it is also for advanced users having the experience of working with a server and virtual machines. In another context, infrastructure as a service in IoT also stands for cloud providers who also offer devices as well as the cloud space to offer an end-to-end -end solution to a company. In the previous example, the provider can also offer the smart modules to be installed on the pumps along with the cloud infrastructure to store and process the data. Among these services, our focus is on cloud platforms for the Internet of Things. Let's look a bit into that in detail. 
all cloud platforms usually offer these two functionalities. First is the ability to accumulate the data from the end devices and store the data on the platform. And second, offering an application framework to build the applications on the platform in order to process the data. Another absolutely necessary element that cloud platforms offer is the ability to access the data remotely. For example, in a healthcare use case, the health data of the patient can be accessed remotely and be available to the family and the doctor of the patient. Although not a necessity, the platforms also offer libraries to write code on the platform and on the end devices as well, where the device side code is written to push the data onto the cloud platform. And finally, these features are optional, however, very useful to the end user. The cloud platforms may offer a rule engine based on which triggers can be set when the data received from the end devices meet certain criteria. For example, send a notification to the doctor if the heart rate of the patient is consistently above a certain value for a predefined period of time. And lastly, visualization of data is essential when it comes to sharing the data and making it more pleasant to read from the end user point of view. This video concludes here. In the next video, we will look at an example of how to get data from a device and visualize it on a cloud platform. If you have any queries, please shoot them across. We looked at the different types of cloud services including platform as a service, software as a service, and infrastructure as a service. We discussed what functionality each of them offer and how they can be used in the context of the Internet of Things. Furthermore, we looked at what cloud platforms offer, primarily storage and remote access to data, an application framework to develop applications to process the data, as well as visualization of data, libraries to write applications, and triggers to be executed based on certain values of the data. In this video, we will look at a particular cloud platform called Zyfly. We will study the personal edition of Zyfly and what this edition offers. With Zyfly, you can accumulate data from multiple devices and store the data. You can manage multiple devices from the platform as well as create a batch of devices, that is, to activate and connect multiple devices of the same type to the platform. For example, you can connect 10 Arduinos or 10 Raspberry Pis to the platform. Cyfly also offers data visualization on their web page and triggers in the form of webhooks. We will take a look into some of these. Let's look at the architecture of how we are going to push the data from a sensor all the way to the Cyfly cloud platform. First, we need to get the data from a sensor. In this case, we will use a Texas Instruments or TI sensor tag. The TI sensor tag is an embedded device that can communicate over Bluetooth Low Energy or BLE and has multiple sensors like pressure sensor, temperature sensor, optical sensor, and humidity sensor, among others. We will send the data from the TI sensor tag to a gateway device over BLE. The gateway device would then push the data to the Zyfly cloud platform over the internet using the HTTP REST API offered by Zyfly. If we look at the hierarchy of the Cyfly cloud platform, it consists of a product which can be considered a class in an object-oriented context. On the other hand, 
a device is like an instance of the class or the product. So if you look at an example, let's say you create a skeleton for a particular product and then you create 1000 of the devices out of this skeleton. So the skeleton of these devices represent the product or the main class whereas these 1000 instances of this class can be classified as the devices. The devices push the data to a feed associated to a user account. The feed can have multiple data streams where each data stream represents a physical quantity. For example, we can have a data stream for a temperature sensor. Each of these data streams contain data points which are individual points of data with the timestamp. Now that we have some idea about the sensor tag, the gateway and the Zively cloud platform, we can look at an example. This is the interface for the Agile Gateway on the right hand side and the personal.zively.com web page for the Zively Cloud Platform. We will add a sensor tag device to the Agile Gateway. We will connect the sensor tag device to the gateway and this is how we see uh, the list of devices by turning on the discovery of nearby devices and here we find uh, the sensor tag device and we register the device to the gateway now we would uh, check the list of devices to ensure that the sensor tag was registered And now we will move on uh, to the Node Red application. The Node Red application allows you to develop application logic based on flows. So here we would use two different nodes. The first node being the one to get the data from the sensor tag. And secondly, we would use another node to push the data to the Zively Cloud Platform. And finally, we would have a debug node to check if the data is actually getting pushed onto the Zively Cloud Platform. Now we would connect these nodes and configure them so that we can get the data to the Cloud Platform. So here we choose the IP of the gateway, we choose the device, that is the sensor tag, and then we choose one of the sensors to get the value from. Then we choose the interval in which we would get the data from the end device, and finally we give the node a particular name. Then we configure the Zively node and we add the API key and the feed ID. The feed ID identifies the feed to which the data will be pushed and the API key is used to actually access and write the data to the cloud platform. Then we choose a name for the variable to which the data will be pushed. The serial number here is not needed because we are not uh, doing a registration of the batch devices that I would come to in a later video possibly. And then when we deploy it we see that the data is getting pushed to the cloud platform and you can see actually the data on the left hand side in the Zively cloud platform interface. We can also see a graphical view of the data by clicking on the data itself. And we can also change the time span for which the data can be seen. In the demonstration, we used the Agile Gateway to get the data from the sensor tag. 
The Agile Gateway is an open source framework for IoT and can be used to connect to peripheral devices and get the data from the devices. And then we can use the gateway to build application logic on Node-RED and that is what we did to push the data to the Zively Cloud Platform. We saw that the data can be stored on the Cloud Platform and can be visualized in the form of graphs as well. We would like to hear from you what more you would like to learn on Cloud Platforms. Please write to us and let us know what you thought about the course. Thank you. Before directly going into that context, I'll mention a few words uh, for this. Many of you know that IoT has set the stage for the fourth industrial revolution. Advances in manufacturing and open source software have made it possible for embedded systems, actuators, embedded sensors to communicate via the internet. The cost of 3G and 4G data, cloud computing infrastructure are going down, making adoption of such devices far, far easier. As a result, we can see the Cisco projection of 50 billion of connected devices by 2020. Consumers are set to benefit a lot from uh, the connected devices scenarios. For example, remote monitoring and actuation are possible now using Internet of Things. The collected data can be processed with next generation tools to get better insights and visualization. IoT can also provide directions for resource optimization in the company. Within those various scenarios, IoT data is the most important part. For example, equipments built into the autonomous car generate about one gigabyte of data every five minutes. This huge volume of data can reveal a great deal of personal information. I'm sure you have heard about the recent outbreak and the Equifax hack. It has affected many uh, thousand customers. Such situations raise the serious security and privacy concerns. The attacks on the IoT system can be broadly classified into three main categories. The first one being taking control of your smart appliances. Then the second one is stealing information about uh, different things like door lock authorization code or the exact location from your fitness device. And third, and the most uh, important one, is disrupting live services. For example, it has happened that malware-infested refrigerators have sent spam links or have done distributed data of service attack to a company. And here is a more detailed threat map, which shows the various levels of attacks like ransomware, cyber criminalism, cyber warfare, physical intrusion to IoT devices, etc. The Internet of Things data is also targeted by many hackers. And in many cases, companies actually launch IoT products that communicate data without any encryption. So the data in transit can be easily gathered and reveal a lot of personal choices. For example, preferred running tracks could be understood from uh, the data logs of different devices like Fitbit. Home appliance use shopping choices, then locations, uh, certain patterns, driving patterns could be understood from uh, IoT data leaks and hacking. Similarly, the databases where the IoT data is stored are subjected to attacks as well. This is observed for bad deployment of MongoDB in, uh, in particular. So how can we address those IoT challenges? So in this uh, presentation, I'm just mentioning four of them. For example, we need to incorporate security by design, which is not the case in many IoT architectures. We need to enforce strong privacy policies. We have to ensure secure communication, encrypted data and storage. And of course, follow OWA speed recommendations. Many of you know that IoT has kickstart the fourth industrial revolution. The market research companies estimate that the Internet of Things is a multi trillion dollar industry worldwide, and by 2020, there will be 30 to 50 billions of devices connected to the Internet. These connected sensors and other devices they're going to generate a massive amount of data. So some companies estimate that it 
be close to four zeta bytes, which is 49 times higher than the total recorded data in 2013. Uh, here is one more such representation of the IRA data generated in different verticals of Internet of Things. As you can see, I mean the projection till 2020 is in uh, multi multiple of zeta bytes. So the first question that comes into our mind is that where do we store the data? So right now, cloud is the de facto solution for this. So typical uh, data storage includes Hadoop distributed file systems, which is a platform for long-term data storage. It has large capacity to handle big data generated in several IoT systems. It promotes data redundancy, like storage of data in multiple cluster nodes. And there are several other alternatives like analytics database, which provides a structure information storage platform, SQL database manager, and we also have CKAN among many other alternatives. Now the second challenge that's very important and at this juncture is how do we provide security and privacy on the IoT data? Uh, as you can see from the picture on the right, it shows the flow of data from the things in the Internet of Things to the gateway to the cloud and then to the enterprise. And in most of the cases, data in transit is what is targeted. So if such data is are not properly encrypted and the channel is not secure, so the IoT data leak and hacking is becoming in, I mean, very common. So such uh, data leak and hacks can reveal personal choices and habits, for example, preferred running tracks, uh, the home appliances or shopping choices you're making, your driving patterns, locations. Also, IoT databases are constantly subjected to different ransomware attacks as we have seen uh, recently around the web. So the next generation storage for Internet of Things must have some uh, requirements from these challenges. First of all, uh, integration of strong security mechanisms should be thereby designed. For example, uh, there has to be encryption so that the data is not stored in plain text. It has to be stored uh, as uh, secure data. Then there has to be strong authentication from where the data is coming. Then there should be distributed storage, enable, enablement of faster data retrieval and processing, and many others. So to continue the discussion around digital storage and Internet of Things, Tom Coughlin and I, we are organizing a storage visions and IoT conference in India in late February 2018. So the government of India has released, has taken some very recent initiatives on digital India and making India. So these are transforming the infrastructure uh, cities into smart cities and many other things and promoting digital transformation at uh, the national as well as international level. So uh, the conference is quite timely. And I briefly mention some of the highlights of the technical program that we are amassing as we speak. So this would be a two-day conference. The first two be packed with industry leading keynotes, sessions and exhibits featuring latest architectures in memory and storage technologies. The second day will be packed with industry keynotes uh, as well and a hands-on training session on how to prototype and market IoT and smart city applications. We would also target and provide some clear visions about future cloud storage for IoT, connected car and industrial IoT. We will uh, provide details about uh, data warehousing for big data and smart city applications. There will also be sessions that raises awareness of digital storage and IoT solutions in India, understand the potential opportunities of Digital India and Making India initiative, and 